Well, here we are. Tonight is the last session of At Home in Mitford. We're going to finish off the book tonight. We have a mere 33 pages to go. 35 pages? 33, 35, something like that. And I think it's all one chapter. So, let's see. Chapter 23, Homecoming. Are you in the mood to have your bed, Doug? He asked through the screen door. Why, yes, she said, turning around from the stove. Good, because I'm in the mood to dig it. Come in and have a cup of tea. The kettle's hot and I'll get dressed. My, you're an early riser. For heaven's sake, stop looking at me, Cynthia said, fleeing from the kitchen in her bathrobe. He took a spoonful of tea out of the canister, put it in the silver caddy, poiled, poiled boring water, <laughs> poured boiling water into the mug, and sat down on the stool by the wall foam. It was nice to have a change of scenery, to get up and sit in someone else's kitchen and look out someone else's back door. For another change, he'd rested well. And since it was Saturday, hadn't set the alarm. Then he'd run along Church Hill by the orchards and looked down upon the village in its, in its spring finery. He had felt such a tenderness of heart for the little town tucked so neatly at the foot of the hill that he had stopped to sit on the stone wall. Sitting on a stone wall, idly gazing, scarcely thinking, Stuart Cullen would have been proud. There, said Cynthia, who had caught her blonde hair in a yellow bow and was wearing blue jeans, a sweatshirt, and sneakers. He thought she didn't look a day over twenty. Any word from your, from your agent? She called last night. She'd like to see more people in it, not just animals. So I was thinking, would you be a wise man? Me being a wise man would be a foolish contradiction. Is this drawing to be from life or the other? She laughed. It depends. If you go to a party at the Sturgeons with me, it will be from life. If you refuse to go, it will be from the other. Digging a bed was no job for the faint-hearted, he thought, especially when it was a king-sized bed. Just dig around here, she said, walking it off in her sneakers, and then come around like this. She paced the circumference of what might have been a small ball field. Cynthia, he said, wiping his brow, that is not a bed. That is your entire backyard. She pushed her glasses up on her nose and peered around. A job for a backhoe, he exclaimed, hoping to make his point. A John Deere tractor, a team of mules. Oh, well, whatever you think, then, she said cheerfully. He dug the long, narrow bed near the sidewalk away from the shade of the oak tree. Do you have something we can break up the clods with and then rake it fine? She came back with a motley assortment of her dead uncle's garden tools, which he reasoned should be in grand condition since he'd never used them. She plunked them down proudly at the edge of the bed. Well then, he said, unable to identify little mo much more than an ancient bulb planter. Let's just break up the clods with our hands. I see you've got good gloves. Then we'll rake it. How's that? Perfect, she said, with redeeming eagerness. What are you going to put in, he asked, as they knelt side by side and went to work. Canterbury Bells, Delphinium, Foxglove, Cosmos, and in the fall, double hollyhocks, gobs and gobs of things. Just then, he heard an oddly familiar sound somewhere. What was it? Still on his knees, he raised his head to listen. It was the great and booming bark, as deep as the base of the organ at Lord's Chapel. Before he could rise or turn around, he was knocked sprawling into the loam of his neighbor's perennial bed, and a warm and lavish bath was administered at once to his left ear. Barnabas had come home. He rolled on his back, shouting with joy and trying to get up, but Barnabas immediately stood on his stomach, finding it a good base from which to administer a bath to Cynthia's face. Timothy, she shrieked, say a scripture and step on it. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, he shouted. It's Jeremiah 29, 13, something like that. Jeremiah, anyways. Barnabas sat on the rector's stomach and sighed. There he lay in the dirt with an enormous mud-caked dog sitting on top of him, while his astonished neighbor was thrashed by a wagging tail the size of a kitchen broom. He laughed until the tears came. I'd like to have a Kodak picture of this deal said a voice overhead. He looked up into the face of homeless Hobbs. This critter was at my door at daylight this morning. 
He was so starved, I give him half a cake of cornbread, and it was gone in one bite. Then I poured up last night's soup, and he ate that. I give him two moon pies, and he chased them down with a bucket of water. I was doing my wash and had to wait for my shirt to dry, so I put a rope around his neck and staked him to my cot. In a little bit, we come on up here, and when he heard you talking, he liked to pull me down, so I let him go. Father Tim got to his feet and embraced his friend from the creek as Barnabas collapsed into the dirt with a contented moan. Homeless, meet my neighbor, Cynthia Coppersmith. Cynthia, meet Samuel K. Hobbs. Mr. Hobbs, she said, throwing her arms around him, you will surely get a blessing for this. I believe I just got my blessing. Father Tim ex examined Barnabas as well as he could through the muddy coat. Looks like he's been on the road for a while. See here, his feet have been bleeding, not to mention he's a bag of bones under all his hair. I have to get him to Hal this afternoon. Barnabas home. How unbelievable, how extraordinary. He felt as if some, some part of him had been returned, like an arm, perhaps, or a leg. He felt strangely, suddenly whole. What he needed was something to suit the occasion. Shouting, maybe, or anything loud and recklessly fervent. Just then, Violet strolled around the side of Cynthia's house, and Barnabas shot away from him like an arrow to its mark. The blur of white raced across the grass and disappeared down the coal chute as Barnabas filled the air with sufficient noise to suit the occasion. Homeless sat at the kitchen counter while the rector brewed a pot of coffee and an exhausted Barnabas lay sleeping by his food bowl at the door. It's a treat to have you in my kitchen for a change, he told his friend from the creek. <sighs> you know, you've brought me something I thought I'd never find again. That brings up my own point, said Homeless. Something I lost has been found, too. And what's that? asked the rector, leaning against the sink. My faith, it looks like it's come back. And to tell the truth, it's a whole lot stronger than it was when it left. I'm glad to hear it. You don't know how glad. Well, I took down the New Testament you brought me, and I said, I believe I'll just crack this open for a minute. I knew I didn't want to be getting go getting no religion out of it. No, sir. So I baited me a hook and I put it on my fishing line and I went and sat down on the creek bank and done something I hadn't done since I was a boy. I tied the line on my big toe. You know, that makes sense. You don't have to mess with the pole. That way, when you get a bite, you know it. And all you have to do is just pull her in. Time saving. So I was sitting there and I commenced to read. And first thing you know, I was dead into it. I'd catch me a crappy, take it off the hook, bait up again, and go back to reading. I'd done that all day, and by the time I'd fried me some fish and had a good dinner, it'd come to me plain as day that my faith was back. God Almighty had put his hand on me again after all these years. You know what I figure? What's that? I figure, what can you lose? Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Well, sir, what of that's a lie? If it's a lie, then you live in sin and die in sin, and the worms consume your flesh anyway. But if it's the God's truth, like he says it is, you win. Your sins are forgiven, you get a clean start, and when you die, you live for eternity. Seems to me that's a deal a man can't pass up. Number one, it's free. Number two, you can't lose. Homeless grinned happily. It's a good feeling, kind of like I've found a home. Your heart is saying you're not homeless anymore. Of course... I don't know what I'm going to do about it yet. Just enjoy it, said the rector. You'll know soon enough, and when you're ready, we'll talk about it if you'd like. Dandy. He poured coffee into, his, into a mug for his guest. I don't have a drop of cream, but there's sugar. I give up cream when I give up liquor. No connection, that's just the way it fell out. You know, they'll be wanting to present you with that $2,500 right away. Well, I ain't taking it, Homeless said, blowing on the steaming coffee. But I got an idea. Keep talking. Up on the hill behind the creek is a lot of folks who need it worse than I do. There's little bitty babies in there that don't get fed right, and old people that needs medicine and a hot meal. There are people that'll slip through the cracks somehow or another. I'd like to see that money go in an emergency fund to help the ones that need it the most. Give old Fred money to buy his own britches instead of wearing mine to look for work. Buy that old, little old Pritchard baby something to wear instead of it running around naked. Get old woman Harmon a pair of shoes. She's been half barefooted for two winters. Maybe have a free supper once a week. I'll do the cooking. I guess I thought there'd be social service agencies in there. 
there's this kind of social service and that kind of social service, if you know what I'm saying. I know. So if the reward money is going to be doled out anyway, I'd like to see it go in a special fund, something we could get to without a lot of flim-flam. Maybe we could call this fund the Crick Bank. What a grand idea in every way. Barnabas looked up when he heard his master laugh. See there, old fellow, what you've done? You've helped buy Fred a new pair of pants. Homeless man refuses check for $2,500, read the Muse headline on Monday. That the story touched hearts throughout the newspaper circulation base was no surprise. The surprise was the additional money that poured in, bringing the total to 3800 in just one week. The front page headline on the following Monday gave an update. Creek Bank overflows. Right there, said Mule Skinner, is the single best headline J.C. Hogan ever wrote. He was doing everything right, including using the food exchange system, which he found to be the very soul of aggravation. But somehow he didn't feel right. He noticed that his hand shook on several mornings as he read the paper, and that his vision blurred occasionally, and his thirst was more pronounced. While all of that had happened before with no dire consequence, he was relieved that Hoppy would check it out in just two days. Perhaps the time when he felt most stable and at peace was when he'd wake in the middle of the night and feel Barnabas at the foot of the bed. The comfort of that was so great that it seemed to alleviate some of the other milder disorders. Lying awake, he often wondered how a vacation in a foreign country, sleeping in strange beds and eating strange food, could possibly make one feel better. He wrote George Gaynor and gave him a complete update on all church doings, including one death and two new members of the nursery. Who are you writing? asked Emma. The man in the attic. You think I ought to send him some fudge? That's a splendid thought. I'm making Harold a big batch tonight. He's so skinny I have to shake the sheets to find him. I'll just make a double batch and mail it tomorrow. Do you think they'll x-ray it for files or razor blades or whatever? Probably. If they're doing their job, they will, she said with authority. Do you know what we sang Sunday? What's that? He muttered, looking in his desk drawer for some glue to repair his bookend. Amazing grace. Aha. If Episcopalians would sing that more instead of all that stuff with no tune, you'd be amazed how people would flock in. Is that a fact? I suppose you think a Baptist wrote that hymn. Well, of course a Baptist wrote it. They sing it all the time. My dear Emma, he said with obvious impatience, that hymn was written by an Episcopalian clergyman. He was probably raised Baptist, she said huffily. Esther Bullock was standing at the front door of the rectory with a cake carrier. Instantly, he knew that he must not at all costs let her give him whatever it contained. Father, Esther, come in. Oh, I can't, she said. I've left the car running, and Jean's home waiting for his supper, but I was baking today, and I know how you like my orange marmalade cake, and so I baked one for Jean's birthday tomorrow, and one for you, and oh, I do hope you like it, because I think it's the best I've ever made. There, that did it. Looking into those bright and expectant eyes, he knew that he could no more refuse that cake than he could run along Churchill Drive stark naked. He paced in front of the refrigerator for a full ten minutes after Esther had gone, finally deciding he must get it out of the house at once. There was no answer at Cynthia's. Russell? Russell and Betty? No, no. He was going to mitigate day after tomorrow, and he'd take it out there. Knowing that cake as he did, he recalled that it would only get better with time. Well, then... He said weakly, staring at the refrigerator. Barnabas had not gotten through that hateful experience without scars, he concluded. When he dropped a book on the hardwood floor of the study, the dog shot from beneath his wing chair, trembling with fear, and bounded up the stairs to hide under the bed. He called Medivy. He'll get over it, said Hal. Give him six months or so for his nervous system to heal, and just keep doing what you're doing. Is he taking the vitamins? Like candy. He's been through a tough time, very likely made his way from Holding all the way to Mitford, which was no picnic. Got any plans for your frequent flyer points? That's something I need to talk with you and Marge about on Wednesday. If you want to leave with the boy with us while you take a break, you know you can. He's starting to be pretty responsible around here. He fed the dogs this morning, helped me clean out the kennels, and ran an errand for Marge. He's a neat kid. I was going to wait until I got there to tell you, but I'm planning a trip to Ireland. Well, wonders never cease. You've been talking about that for years. Time to put up or shut up. 
but I want you to know that other arrangements could be made for Dooley. This may be for a couple of months. Um, well, he's got some roots going down here. I don't believe I disturbed them, Tim. I don't want to say anything to the boy yet. Come on out, then. I've got a sick horse on the next farm, and it doesn't look too good. Call it. I may have duels with me, but we'll catch you around supper time. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Don't mention it, said Halloween. He was suffering from his usual evening exhaustion, which he had recently begun to identify as old age. Perhaps he needed to join Barnabas in a vitamin program. At a little after nine, the phone rang. It was Stuart. Am I interrupting anything? Absolutely nothing of consequence, I'm sorry to say. He was, in fact, very sorry to say it. He would prefer to announce that he'd been reading Archbishop Carey's book or doing sit-ups, something profitable. I've just spoken with Father John. His mother day died late last night. Quite sudden, the family is devastated. He's going home in the morning to spend some time with his father, who isn't well. I'm sorry about this for many reasons, not the least is of which is the jumble it may make of your trip. You are planning a trip. Oh, indeed. The congregation has given me a vast store of frequent flyer points, and I'm planning to go to Ireland with Walter and Catherine. Bravo. Well done. It'll just take a jot of time to work out Plant B. Father Douglas, would he be available? Father Douglas is writing a book and won't budge from his PC. Aha. Uh -huh. Let me think through this, and I'll get back to you. How's Cynthia? I must call and find out. I've been meaning to do that. Yes, please do that, Timothy, said the bishop. He who hesitates is lost, especially where women are concerned. By the way, I'm thankful to have your news about Barnabas. When he hung up, he noticed that the receiver seemed heavy, like a barbell. He turned out the lights in the study and went to the kitchen and opened the refrigerator door. There was that blasted cake carrier. Thank God it wasn't a see-through carrier. One glimpse of that cake and he'd be dead meat. This way it might contain a lump of coal, for all he knew. Barnabas was already sleeping at the foot of his bed when he came upstairs. As he took his socks off, he noticed his feet and ankles were oddly swollen, something he'd never noticed before. Had he been on his feet a lot today? No more than any other day. He remembered going with a parish group on an intensive three-day bus tour of the gardens in Vermont. His ankles had swelled exactly like this. It's the walking, said his curate. It's the sitting, said the choir director. I don't like it. Poppy told him on Tuesday afternoon, and proceeded to run a series of uncomfortable tests. The rector decided he'd wait to hear the results on Wednesday morning, then head to Meadowgate. The bulletins would be done, and Evensong posters had just been reprinted, and he, as well as Barnabas, could do with the country air. He returned to the office after seeing Hoppy, and sat staring at the door. He made an effort to pay attention to his calendar, and saw the dreaded words, Rose Festival, which he'd marked in for this coming Friday and Saturday. Had he prepared anything to say? If his life had depended on it, he couldn't be certain whether he had or not. He looked at the book-lined walls, which seemed to be closing in on him, and then at Barnabas, snoring in the corner. No, it wasn't Barnabas he heard snoring. It was the sound of his own breath coming in short, hollow gasps. He sat there, praying. Then, with the only ounce of energy he could summon, he left the office, forgetting to lock the door, and walked home. He saw Cynthia in her yard as he came around the corner of the rectory. Hello, she said, cheerfully popping through the hedge in a denim smock and jeans. I'm looking forward to this evening. Around 6.30, they said. I hope that's okay. You'll like the sturgeons, I promise. Those fish people. 6.30. What was she saying? You look a bit fagged out, Timothy. Would you like a cup of tea or a sherry? No, he said curtly. Well then, she murmured backing away with a bewildered look. I'll just see you at my house around 6.15. I'll be there, he said vaguely, going up his back steps. Be there for what? He would find out later. Right now he wanted a glass of tea, water, anything, something cold. He let the leash drop and heard Barnabas dash into the hall and bound up the steps with it clattering behind him. He saw the tea container in the refrigerator door, but the sight of the cake carrier was suddenly so compelling that he couldn't take his eyes off it. Something cold. The cake would be cold and sweet. Dear God, he was wrenched with a craving for something sweet. If only one bite, surely one small bite couldn't hurt. He took the carrier out gingerly, as if trying to prevent an alarm from going off and announcing his indiscretion to the neighborhood. His hand shook as he snapped off the top and stood staring at what Esther Pollock had done 
in an act of innocent generosity. Then, without thinking about it any further, he cut a large slice, ate it standing over the sink, and went back for another piece. At four o'clock, feeling somehow revived, he sat in his wing chair in the bedroom. He was trying to get dressed for the evening, but something was wrong, he told himself, looking at his feet. Possibly it was his shoes. He seemed to be wearing one black loafer and one brown loafer. Was that it? He wasn't sure. Perhaps it was something worse, something more grave than shoes. He studied the situation, keeping his eyes on the clock, and was finally interested to see that he had not put his trousers on. He was sitting there in his shorts. He knew this was true because he could see his legs quite plainly. Pants, he said aloud. He looked in his closet and found something that felt like pants. It was not a jacket, it was definitely pants, folded over a hanger. Water. He'd meant to drink water, but had somehow forgotten. First he must get his pants on, though he couldn't understand how it might be done. They seemed to be upside down. He saw that he couldn't stick, stick, couldn't stuff his feet in through the cuffs. That wasn't right. He knew that wasn't right. He would sit down and think about it, he decided, dragging the pants behind him and going to the chest of drawers. He would need... What would he need? Cufflinks? The Spurgeons just might dress up for this affair. Charles Spurgeon had said, Christianity rests upon the fact that Christ is risen from the dead. His sovereignty depends upon his resurrection. He was thrilled that they'd be visiting the Spurgeons. In fact, Spurgeon was among the saints he had most wanted to meet in heaven. The room seemed still as a tomb, suspended in time. He knew at last that he could not keep running. He was getting out of breath. He was hurrying too fast. It was all too much. He could not go on. He felt for the foot of the bed and worked his way around to the side. Then he pulled the covers back and got in, still wearing his shoes and clutching his pants breathing the invitation. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. He was not surprised to see that the Spurgeons were having fish for dinner, but he was surprised to see the Lord sitting at the table when they walked into the high ceilinged room. He felt his heart hammer in his breast. Timothy, I have a purpose for this time in your life. Yes, Lord, he replied, and at once the hammering ceased, and a sweet peace invaded him, and he was floating. He lifted up through the roof of the rectory and over the village, and saw the monument that anchored the little town and Lou Boyd's Esso, where Coot and Lou were looking up and waving to him as he passed. He saw that he had great wings, the wings of a butterfly, that they were an iridescent yellow and purple and as smooth as velvet. The air rushed under him like a caress. He was buoyed along without effort, and found that the movement of his wings wasn't for the sake of keeping him aloft, but was for joy's sake alone. He passed over the town, over the green and rolling countryside, and in the distance he saw a ribbon gleaming in the light. It was a river, a broad, winding river, and on the other side there was a small church. He flew down, flew down, attracted to a single flower in the churchyard, and lighted there. Then the procession came, with everyone dressed in white, led by a man who was bearing a wooden cross. He placed the cross in a newly dug hole near the church door, and dirt was cast into the hole and the children brought flowers and pressed their roots into the damp earth around it. Then the man lifted his hands and prayed, thanking God for new life and for hope. The butterfly flew to the cross and lighted there. As he left the shroud of death, said the man, and rose to new life, so this butterfly, which was once trapped in a cocoon, has become free. Go in new life with Christ. Go and be as the butterfly. The butterfly lifted its wings and flew. It soared above the church in the sunshine. It saw the river again and a cool, sudden breeze, the kind found in the brewing of a storm, moved in from the west. The butterfly passed over the town anchored by the monument and over Fernbank sitting on the hill in the orchards. Then there was the red roof of the little house next door and the slate roof of the rectory. His head felt thick as if he had been drugged or struck a blow. Uneasily, he rolled over and saw someone sitting in the glow of his bedside lamp looking at him. Cynthia put her hand on his forehead. He could not speak, nor could he understand her when she spoke. Timothy, she said, I'm here. Profound dehydration, said Hoppy. He had pried the rector's jaws up and was looking at his tongue and mouth. He's not responding. He may have had a stroke. No, Cynthia said. Cynthia said softly. She heard a siren going off somewhere or his sugar may have dropped off the cliff. I'm going to give him a little dextrose now. I told the ambulance to follow me just in case. 
Go down and make sure they find us. It's a new driver. When she came back up the stairs with the, ambul with the ambulance attendants, he was shocked again to see the eyes which could not see her. His dextro stick was off the top of the scale. I think I know what's going on, Poppy told Nurse Kennedy, coming along the hall behind the stretcher. I want those lab results immediately. Woo. But doctor, there's nobody. I don't want to hear nobody, he snapped. You do what has to be done, pronto. Yes, sir. I'm praying, said Cynthia. He turned to the older nurse, who was waiting calmly for his directions. Herman, he needs fluid and lots of it. Run a liter of half-normal saline wide open, then cut it back to 500 cc till we get the report. Yes, doctor. He was walking up a flight of stairs. They seemed to narrow to a point, with an opening at the end as small as the eye of a needle. A brilliant light shone beyond the opening. He didn't know whether he could make it through. Well, pal. He opened his eyes and stared at the doctor's face finding it an unutterably welcome sight. Well, what? He croaked, glad for the sound of his own voice. You took a dive. No kidding. You've gone and got yourself the real thing. Meaning? The big one. You have to start giving yourself shots and peeing on a strip of paper. The nurses will be teaching you how to give yourself insulin, and I've ordered a glucometer so you can follow your blood sugar. Bad news. The good news is you're alive. Not always the usual after several hours in a non-ketotic hyperglycemic coma. With some effort, he realized that the good news was he wouldn't have to make a speech, that blasted rose festival. Though he was feeling fine, he was strictly forbidden to have visitors. Except your neighbor, said the doctor, without further comment. He learned to his surprise that he would be up and around and better than new in only a few days, so there was no obstacle, after all, to his trip. There would be certain inconveniences, yes, like a daily shot that he'd have to administer himself, extreme caution with his diet, and plenty of exercise, none of which promised to enrich foreign travel. In the meantime, Father Douglas was found to be willing to stir from his PC after all, and agreed to deliver both sermons for the coming Sunday. Father Lewis in Wesley had cheerfully offered to celebrate. By the second day, he'd received seven arrangements, a Glauxinia and a topiary, giving him the pleasure of knowing that Jenna Ivy, at least, was profiting from his condition. Cynthia came, wearing something emerald-colored and flowing. A bedtime story, she said, opening a manila envelope containing her new manuscript. See what you think. She made herself comfortable on the foot of his bed and read aloud the story of the mouse in the manger. What did he think? Merely that it was beautifully written, thought-provoking and charming, not to mention touching, funny, and decent destined for certain recognition. All that, all that and more. I've heard that sickness softens the heart, but it's made yours positively expansive. Thank you for being there, he said, taking her hand. When you didn't come to fetch me for the sturgeons, I thought you'd stood me up. I knew you hadn't been thrilled about going anyway, so I waited and waited and you didn't come, and finally I popped through the hedge and knocked on your door, and there was no answer, but Barnabas was in the kitchen, barking his head off. I called, but couldn't find you. I looked in the study, the garage, all over. And then I went upstairs and found you in bed, clutching a pair of pants in your hand. You did? And with your shoes on. The usual, then. She laughed. But I could tell you weren't sleeping. You looked so odd, and you were sweating, and your mouth was moving, though nothing was coming out. I called the hospital, and Hoppy wasn't there. And I said it was an emergency, so they found him and sent him to your house. Thanks be to God. He pressed her hand tightly. I can't remember anything at all. Nothing. The last thing I remember was eating Esther's cake. Esther's cake? He looked at her helplessly. I hope you won't say anything to Hoppy. He saw the concern in her eyes. I promise. But let it be a lesson to you, for Pete's sake. Will you come again tomorrow? Yes, she said, leaning down to brush his cheek with her lips. At the door, she turned around and waved. He thought she looked for a moment like a wistful child. Sweet dreams, she said, tilting her head to one side. The faint scent of wisteria on his pillow was a comfort. I wouldn't be kissing any blarney stone if I was you, said Puny, plumping up the cushions on the sofa. When you think of how many folks has put their mouth on that thing, 
it gives me the shivers. I have no intention of hanging over some precipice to kiss a rock, said the rector, who was taking his prescribed midday rest in the study. Instead, I will devote that time to shopping for one puny Bradshaw and shipping her a surprise. As if I didn't have enough surprises, she said tartly, dusting the mantle. Like what? Like Jojo getting shot and you getting in a coma and half dying. That's been keeping me plenty surprised, thank you. Not to mention busy. Speaking of busy, would you keep doing the splendid things you do for the priest who takes my place while I'm in Ireland? I might, she said cautiously. I'd have to check him out. I don't work for gripers, complainers, or hypocrites, not to mention bossy, mean, or stingy people. A good policy. I wish I could say the same. If I'm still away when school starts, would you be able to live here and take care of Dooley till I get back? Well, just think, Jojo wouldn't have to drive all the way to Westley to court you. He could just walk down the street. She flushed. Think about it. It would nearly double your salary, and all you'd need to do... All you'd need to cook for the boy would be bologna, which, if the priest is young enough, he'd probably like too. She sighed. I wonder why the Lord is always dishing out preachers to me. Dear friends, when I left Miss Pritt several weeks ago, you couldn't see me, but I could see you. Thank you for coming out to wave goodbye. Especially, I want to thank the kids who cared and sent those wonderful drawings to the jail. I've been allowed to put up a few of them in my cell, and you'd be surprised to see how much they mean to the other inmates. In this grim and oppressive place, the bright colors stand out vividly, but more than anything, it's a joy to see the freedom in your drawings. They are spontaneous and genuine, and seem to give a certain hope to people who are clearly destitute of hope. I'm pretty isolated from contact with the other inmates as I work in the laundry with just five other men. The exercise yard is about the size of the grassy area around your town monument. I go every evening after supper Try to keep myself in shape. Mostly it's good for clearing my head, as I often feel a real panic about being here. They told me I'd have to keep an eye on my watch and my shaving kit, but that nobody would steal my Bible. If they could imagine the riches to be found in it, they'd all be after it, and that's what I'm praying for. I don't know what I can say in this letter. I don't know what's being censored, but I feel pretty certain they will let me say this. I found something in Mitford that I never believed existed. After I prayed that prayer with Father Tim and my new brother, Pete Jameson, God changed my life. Then he demonstrated his love through you. Thank you for the shoes, the casseroles, the cakes, the pies, and your prayers. Please write me if you can. Sincerely, George Gaynor. The rector lowered the latest edition of the muse into his lap. The Mayo clerks at that prison had their work cut out for them. It's Mr. Gregory announced Puny, wiping her hands on her apron. He knew that he should have shaved this morning. Ask him to come in. He heard Andrew's footsteps coming briskly down the hall. A bachelor of paradise, he said, seeing the book-lined study, the view of Baxter Park, and the bright face of Puny Bradshaw. He inhaled deeply, enjoying a fragrance that clearly had its source in the kitchen. The rector got up and gave his favorite antiquarian a forceful embrace. Sit down at once, my friend, and tell me everything. I haven't seen you in... When have I seen you? You'd think that since we're across the street from each other, we'd meet more often. Life, father, life, said Andrew, sitting down in the wing chair and unbuttoning his jacket. It is far too hurried. Even in Mitford. Particularly in Mitford, I sometimes believe. How are you feeling? Are you going to push along all right? Oh, I think so. A bitter inconvenience, nothing more. Would y'all like a cup of tea or a, a cup of coffee or a glass of tea? Asked Puny. The rector thought she looked a picture in her new apron and dress and her red hair caught up with a green ribbon. Tea, Andrew responded eagerly. No sugar, if you please. I'll have the same, said the rector. He was tenderly amused to see that Puny, who appeared to be in awe of their handsome visitor, curtsied slightly as she left the room. Where on earth did you find such a gem? Sent from heaven. Speaking of heaven, I have a new shipment of books from a priory in Northamptonshire. Very rare, exceptional. One day they won't allow such treasures out of the country. There's a very early imitation of Christ. I thought that you'd like to come and have a look. I shall. It's a good thing books aren't bad for this aggravating condition or I'd be a dead man. Any more sales on Uncle Billy's drawings? Why, yes, four more. 
and I took him an envelope only yesterday. He likes cash, you know, not checks, and I fear he may be keeping it under his mattress. Not a bad move, considering the times. Andrew, Andrew laughed. I read George Gaynor's letter in the paper, and only yesterday I heard that two of the three British side dealers have been arrested in Norwich. Fascinating circumstances, really. I tried to keep up with the account of the papers. I inspected all my table legs, but not one is worth a farthing. What can, you, what can you tell me about Ireland? Ireland? Only a bit. Hopeless Anglophile, you know. Of course, there's been a big trend to Irish antiques, but they're not my cup of tea. Too primitive. Why do you ask? I'm going in a matter of days. Thought you might have some suggestions. We'll be staying in Sligo. Ah, rough country, undeveloped, but spectacularly beautiful, I'm told. Take a raincoat, mud boots, a waterproof watch. Blast, he thought. Why bother to go to such a place at all? Your tea, sir, said Puny, who had put the rectory's best damask napkins on the tray and used their finest cut glass water goblets. Andrew took a sip of tea and pressed his mouth with the starched napkin. I haven't seen much of your neighbor. Is she still about? Oh, very much about. Clever lady. Yes, yes, she is. Terribly attractive. Rather pretty, yes. Funny, actually. I agree. I can't seem to make any headway with her, however. I suspect you know her a bit, being next door. Any suggestions? Tall, suave, trim, urbane Andrew Gregory was asking him? He thought for a moment. Oh, she'd probably enjoy being invited to more of those fancy country club affairs. Perhaps to play bridge, that sort of thing. He lied. Forgive me, Lord, he prayed. I promise I won't do it again. As Puny saw Andrew to the door, the phone rang. Hello? He said. He heard someone breathing. Hello? I prayed that. Do, 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 do. I need to see this for a minute. Hmm. I prayed that prayer, said a hoarse voice, and hung up. Was that by any chance, Jojo? Puny asked eagerly, hurrying into the study. No, it wasn't. I'm not sure who it was. The voice had been oddly familiar, but no. No, it couldn't have been who he was thinking. You don't know who it was? I didn't recognize the voice exactly, and then they hung up. Wrong number, said Puny, setting the glasses on the tray and taking it to the kitchen. Absalom Greer looked at him steadily. My brother, if I step into your pulpit, some of your flock will be gone when you return. So be it. They were sitting on the steps of the country store on a day so hot that both had taken their jackets off and rolled their shirt sleeves up. You know I'll preach on sin. Preach on it, then. I'll preach a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I fervently hope so. And I'll preach the cross. That's what we all need to hear. May God bless you, my friend. And may he bless you, Timothy. I didn't know when I quit my little churches last week to get a rest that the Lord would hitch me up again before he let the traces fall. The old pastor laughed happily. I'll see that Lottie dresses me proper. I'll keep my shoes shined and a handkerchief in my pocket. That's more than I usually manage. How thankful I am that your schedule allows this. It was a sudden inspiration in the middle of the night. I believe the Holy Spirit put it on my heart. Can you hold out for two months? When it comes to preaching, I'd a lot rather hold out than hold it in. I'll answer this call at your place, then I'll quit. They stood up, and Father Tim clasped the pastor's hand with both of his. We'll go through the order of service until you get the hang of it, and the bishop will provide someone to celebrate. It's pretty unorthodox, you know, Absalom said. I trust the orthodoxy of it enough to trust the unorthodoxy, replied the rector, returning his gaze and smiling. The trip to the airport had become a dilemma. Joe Ivy, Mule Skinner, Ron Malcolm, and Hal Owen had all volunteered to drive. Emma, however, had insisted which settled that consequential matter. Well, of course, you must leave Barnabas with us, said Marge, when they talked on the phone. But you've done, you're doing so much already, he protested sincerely. Just think of all you do for us, Timothy. Frankly, he couldn't think of anything at all. In his last sermon, he made every effort to prepare the congregation. Pastor Greer warns me that some of my flock will have leapt over the wall by the time I return but I challenge you to remain in the fold and hear what he has to say and to ponder it in your hearts. I have not made this decision lightly, nor has the bishop been casual in giving his blessing. There will be some awkward moments, very likely, for Pastor Greer doesn't know our order of service, 
But I want you to pray for him and give him the right hand of fellowship and keep a strong hedge around yourselves until I return. Some of his flock looked quizzically at him as he greeted them on the church lawn. No one liked change. And why in heaven's name couldn't he have brought in Father Douglas, who they at least knew? What did it matter if his sermons were largely tepid? He was comfortable. They were comfortable. And surely any bishop worth his salt could have talked him into leaving his book, which probably wasn't going to be very exciting anyway. Or Father Randall. Now there was somebody who'd pep the place up and make a contribution, though there was always the question of his unfortunate preference for guitar music at the 11 o'clock. And what about this preacher being a Baptist, for heaven's sake? They only hoped he would not raise his voice and shout, or worse yet, issue an altar call. In the cool of the evening, he walked to Fernbank with Barnabas, taking his time on the hill, and found Miss Sadie and Luella sitting on the porch, fanning. Ladies, what's up? What's up is that we're looking for company, Miss Sadie told him. Luella and I were just talking about how nobody visits on Sundays like they used to. What on earth do you think people do if they don't visit? They go to the mall, said the rector, out of breath. He sat on the steps with Barnabas and was grateful for the cool steps on the east side of the house. Surely not. However, the old customs haven't vanished entirely. After all, here am I. Let Barnabas come up with us, said Miss Sadie, who was still in her church clothes. Luella drew away from Barnabas. That's the biggest dog I ever seen. I live in houses ain't as big as that dog. Barnabas clapped at Miss Sadie's feet and yawned contentedly. There now, what a treat. Luella, do you suppose we ought to get a dog? Oh, la! Luella was speechless. Well, Father, you should know that we're all in a dither about Absalom Greer coming to supply us while you're gone. I think that was a very odd thing to do, but I'm excited about it. You're right. It was a very odd thing to do, but I think the oddity of it will have its effect. Will you give me a report on how things are going now and then? I'll leave you an itinerary with addresses and phone numbers. And I wanted to say I'll write you ladies every week. That's a promise. You spoil us, Father. You really have. Nearly 13 years and barely missing a Sunday except for special meetings of the diocese and that awful winter when the flu kept you down. You know to call Hal or Ron if you need anything. And Esther Bollock and Emma will look out for you. Why, after a day or so, you'll be saying... Father who? I like the story. You know Olivia will be coming home soon, he said. Perhaps you'd care to call her. Oh, we've been talking about that, said Luella. Miss Sadie going to have her up to try on all those fine hats, and I'm going to fry her some chicken that will melt in her pretty mouth. Yes, sir. And we'll sit at the dining table, won't we, and use Mama's china? Oh, let's just sit in the kitchen where it's comfortable and not put on airs for Miss Olivia. Let's just treat her like family. Why, Luella, that's a perfect idea. What will we have with the chicken? Father Tim got up and went to Miss Sadie's rocking chair. He leaned down and kissed his eldest parishioner on the forehead, then turned and gave Luella a kiss on her cheek. Keep up the good work, he said. <sighs> Remember, I'll write you every week. He hurried down the steps with Barnabas and out into the drive, where he stopped and looked back, grinning. Stay out of trouble, he said. Let's have a romantic dinner by candlelight, suggested Cynthia, who had dropped by his office on her way to the local. That sounds good, but I had another suggestion, if you're interested. Try me, she said, tilting her head and looking pleased with life. Why don't we take a drive in the country? I love to drive in the country. On my motor scooter. On your motor scooter? That little red thing? The very same. We can take a picnic. Where would we put it? Well, I don't know. I haven't thought it through. Obviously not. But I will. I will think it through. I'll devise a plan, and you'll be stunned by the brilliance, the wit, the foolishness of it. She laughed with delight. I love it when you talk like that. The minute you devise your plan, let me know. Anything I can pick up for you at the local? Nothing, thanks, he said, seeing her to the door. She was on the sidewalk when he called, her, called to her. Cynthia? Yes? She turned around and smiled. I'll miss you, he said. He was dreading it. Dreading it all. He had not been on an airplane in nine years, and to fly across the ocean was suddenly unthinkable. Travel always sounded wonderful when one considered the end, but to consider the means was quite another story. 
Walter and Catherine had gleefully reported that the farmhouse had feather beds, but as he recalled from boyhood days at his grandfather's, feather beds contained more than feathers. He recalled hearing faint chewing sounds that lasted the live long night. Then there was the issue of where the bathrooms were. They believed both rooms had baths en suite, but then again, one of the baths, and guess whose it would be, just might be a step or two down the hall. He sat in his chair in the bedroom and looked at the results of his feeble packing effort. He wouldn't leave for four days yet, but he thought it best to start working on that aggravating project now. Timothy, he said aloud, causing Barnabas to look around curiously, you have a rotten attitude about this trip. Back up and start over. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to go to this wonderful part of your world. Thank you for making provision through the sacrifices of so many people and for bringing it all together in a way that is clear evidence of your grace. Thank you for a good home for Dooley and Barnabas. May you bless the Owens exceedingly for their care for us. Forgive me for being dark-spirited about what is certainly a privilege and enable me to take care of every need before I go. And Lord, show me what to pack. Leave this packing alone, said Puny. You are making a mess. You have two pairs of underwear in here and nine handkerchiefs. You have three pairs of cufflinks and no French cuff shirts. He was alarmed to see how she was undoing what he had so carefully done. You just go on and let me handle this. I packed for my grandpa all the time when he was traveling with a revival tent. He was neat as a pin. He said he got compliments all the time about the way he turned himself up. What's this? That, he said irritably, is my diabetes case. Ugh, she said, looking inside. Needles. What's this? Those are the strips to dip in my urine to des test blood sugar levels. Do you have something to pee in? Puny. Well, think about it. You might need a little jar. You could get over there in that foreign country and you don't know what you might have to pee in. Put it in a jar then, he said. I'm so glad you got Mr. Greer and another preacher ain't moving in here. I hope you don't mind that I prayed about it. They had parked the car on the dirt road, climbed through a barbed wire fence, crossed a meadow brimming with daisies, and climbed a green knoll dotted with buttercups. They spread the quilt where pines and blue spruce cast a cool shade. He lay down, put his hand behind his head, and looked up at a sky filled with vast cumulus clouds. He felt as if he might have been journeying to this very place for the duration of his 61 years. Surely this was destination enough. Could Ireland be any greener? Its hills any nobler? Is this heaven? inquired Cynthia, who was also lying on her back, looking up at the clouds. Well, of course it is. Just look over there to the right. You see that chariot with an angel driving it? Look, Timothy, do you see? One thing he liked about his neighbor. It did not take much to entertain her. I was looking at the face of Beethoven myself. Where? she asked eagerly. Straight up. See that wild mane of hair? Why, that's not Beethoven at all, she said with urgent sincerity. That's Andrew Jackson. See, he surprised himself by laughing so hard he couldn't stop, nor did he want to. Being joined by his neighbor in this foolish collapse made it even better. When the spasm had passed, Cynthia fetched a handkerchief out of her skirt pocket and blew her nose with some abandon. Doesn't it feel grand to laugh over nothing, she wondered. Why don't we laugh more? I think we forget, he said, wiping his eyes. How could we possibly forget to laugh when it feels so good and cures so much? How could we possibly? He had no answers. Ever since he was a child, he had been prone to forget about laughing. When I was a girl, I used to get tickled in chapel. I must tell you that it was the most delicious laughter I ever enjoyed in my life because it was so forbidden. But, oh, it was terribly painful, too. I would laugh till I hurt, and the tears would be streaming down my cheeks but I had to keep all the rest of it inside because if one single little bit of laughing slipped out, well, you know, sudden death. Dear Cynthia, they said, she sits in chapel and cries. What a tender heart. Oh, dear. He smiled. How good to lie on his back and talk of nearly nothing and feel the breeze now and then and hear the bawling of a calf and the song of juncos in the hedge. He could not remember when he had been so supremely contented. He reached over and took her hand and turned his head to look at her. He thought that if he dared kiss her, he would devour her. He would kiss her lovely cheek and the tip of her nose, her forehead and her hair. He would not be responsible. He would come undone. 
It seemed dangerous merely to breathe. Timothy, look at that funny cow staring at us. He raised his head slightly and froze. Do not move, he said. That is a bull. Oh, for heaven's sake, she whispered. This happens in comic books, not in real life. Will we be gored? He did not feel confident about sitting up, but he felt less confident about lying down. So he continued to hold his head up, gazing at the bull somewhere over its left flank, feeling that eye contact was not advisable. I think that what I should do is stand up slowly, and then you should run for the woods. I'll take the basket, she volunteered in a low voice. I will not share my raspberry tart with that oaf. He forced himself into a sitting position. How would J.C. handle the story? In the obituaries or on the front page? The bull looked at him with consuming interest as he managed to stand, albeit unsteadily. His knees had nearly gone out. Okay, run, he said evenly to his neighbor. He heard her do that very thing. Were frequent flyer points refundable, he wondered. The bull gazed at him steadily. Then it lowered its head and turned to lumber down the hill to a shade tree at the edge of the meadow without looking back. The rector picked up the quilt and trudged to the edge of the woods to meet Cynthia, who was standing by a pine tree, shaking with laughter. It's stressful in the country, he said, grinning. I vote that the best picnic lunch of my life, she declared. The best cold chicken, the best French bread, the best cheese, the best raspberry tart. I agree with all of that, he said, trying to ignore his increasing appetite for holding her in his arms. She took a small sketchbook out of her skirt pocket and a box of pencils. I don't suppose you care to put one corner of the quilt over your head? Not particularly. Why, for heaven's sake? I'm starting on the wise men, and this is my very last chance at you, you know. All you have to do is sit over there and pull the quilt up around your head, like this. That's all? How long will it take? Five minutes. I'll hurry. Then when I get to my drawing board, I'll use the sketch as a model for the watercolor. She peered at him. Actually, if you get on your knees, it will be easier. For who? For me, I think. Here, get on your knees and I'll fix the quilt like a burnous, sort of. She took the raffia that he'd used to keep the napkin wrapped around the raffia that he'd used to keep the napkin wrapped around the bread, put the quilt over his head, and tied it. There, she said approvingly, you look just like you've come from afar. He was relieved that the ordeal was nearly over when he looked up to see an old man and woman coming along a path leading from the wood to the knoll. They were carrying burlap sacks filled with newly dug ferns, an occupation pursued by a number of locals. As oddly stricken as if he'd been caught thieving chickens, he could not seem to budge from his knees, nor remove his burnous. Good afternoon, he called weakly. They paused, looked at him quizzically, then turned and hurried back into the woods. And that feller's a preacher! he heard the man say to his wife. They sat on the grassy knoll until the shadows lengthened over the quilt. They had found peace here today and laughter, and he was thankful. Cynthia, he said quietly, holding both of her hands. I've thought about it. She tilted her head and gazed at him. There was a happy light in her eyes which spoke her own thoughts. He had decided to be simple simple and direct. I can't make that decision yet, he said. I'd like to think about it while I'm away, but if that's asking too much, then you've only to deny me the privilege of thinking about it any more at all. She listened without speaking, but her, but her hands clasped his tightly. I won't try to kid you. I honestly don't know what I want to do. All I know is that I want the decision to be right and good. If I were younger, it would be an easy decision. But I've been so one-track minded for so long that I don't know if I can run on two tracks without causing a collision. She smiled, nodding. I care, very, I care very much for you, Cynthia. He had a sudden foreboding that he might begin to croak, so he was silent for a while, simply looking at her. She saw in her spirit such a tender willingness that he was touched. She had a gift for touching him, with laughter, with delight, with deep feeling, with hope. At first, she said quietly, I was hurt that you didn't answer right away, but I think I've come to understand you better just recently. And I feel good about what you're saying. Yet there's something in me that says, you fool, you've been pushy and presumptuous. He doesn't care for you any more than all the other people he's so lovely to. And you'll frighten him off if you don't back away. And then, and then the path through the hedge will grow over. The path through the hedge will grow over. 
Hadn't she been the one with the courage to blaze that path in the first place? He took her into his arms and held her close and kissed her hair. They were silent for a long time. Then he kissed her cheek and the bridge of her nose. We must not let the path through the hedge grow over, he said with feeling. Good morning, good morning, good morning, said Mule Skinner, coming through the door in an orange and turquoise shirt with a blanket motif. I followed that shirt in the door, said Rodney, who was behind him, and you're under arrest. What for, said Mule, for disturbing the peace. You want to arrest somebody, pick on that fella right there, said Mule, pointing to J.C. Hogan in the back booth with Father Tim. What did he do? Forgot to run my ad this week. I need a half page. J.C. was sopping his toast in sausage gravy. We'll run it next week and give you a free one the following week. That's no more than anybody at the Wesley paper would do, said Mule, who often threatened to take his real estate advertising elsewhere. So how about if I give you two free ads? There was a stunned silence. Go for it, said Rodney. Deal, said Mule, incredulous. Quarter pagers, said J.C. The rector grinned. How accustomed he'd grown to the simple familiarity of friends in this small place on the map. Midford had given him an extended family with cousins galore and no two alike. The usual, Percy told, Mule told Percy, and squeeze the grease out. I'll squeeze you some grease on your bald head. What would he find in Sligo? Considering that half of Midford had Irish blood, with a liberal dose of Scottish thrift, darn it, I missed all these opportunities for Irish accents, dreadful ones, with a liberal dose of Scottish thrift, what he'd find might not be so different after all. He hoped there would be a warm place like the grill in the village near the farmhouse. Percy, said J.C., there's something unusual about these grits. Oh, yeah? Percy said suspiciously. They're real good and thick and got plenty of butter the way I like them. Percy beamed. I never used to eat grits, but now that I've started eating them of the morning, I'll make them the way that tastes good to me. Was something different about J.C., Father Tim wondered? Maybe so, but he couldn't put his finger on it. The only thing is, said J.C., this gravy's got lumps the size of banty eggs. The rector finished his coffee and stood up from the booth. Boys, I've got more to do than I can shake a stick at, and Emma's picking me up at the crack of dawn tomorrow. Hold it in the road till I get back. They all got out of the booth and stood up. It wasn't every day that one of their own went off to a foreign country. Mule slapped him on the back. Don't take any wooden nickels, buddy Row. Drop us a line, said J.C., but keep it short and ask the big words. Rodney shook his hand. Take it easy, Father. I'll miss all the business you've been giving me lately. God bless you, said Percy, choking up. And put your money back in your pocket. It's on the house. There, he thought untying Barnabas from the bench leg on the sidewalk. It's official. I'm really going to go through with this thing. They walked down to see the place where Dooley was currently catching his fish bait, down into the cool, sweet-scented woods where the only sounds were bird calls and running water. How thankful he was that Dooley Barlow could have this golden time in his life. It would provide nourishment the rest of his days. So I wanted to come out and say goodbye, he said squatting down on the creek bank beside the boy. Goodbye yourself, said Dooley, slapping the water with a stick. I'm going because I need to, son. Not necessarily because I want to, but I want to say that I'll miss you. He tells of the boy's hair. You don't need to miss me, said Dooley, looking at him frankly. I've got plenty to do. I probably won't miss you. Well, heck, I was kind of hoping you would. Oh, I might once in a while, you know, if I don't have nothing else to do. That's fair enough. Hal and Marge say you're doing all right out there, out here, keeping up your end. They're old friends, and they mean a lot to me, so I thank you for helping them. They need help, Dooley said flatly. That old Rebecca Jane, she cries a lot and all, and crawls around eating dog food out of bone meal's dish and peeing in her pants, and Doc Owen, he don't have nobody to help him clean out the horse poop and look after the kennel. He even gets me to help him deliver calves. He'd never seen Dooley looking so proud and he could have sworn he'd grown an inch or two since he saw him just ten days ago. You learned something from Hal Owen. You know what he told me? What's that? He said I could be anything I want to be. That's true. You can. Dooley slapped the water with a stick. Anything? Anything. 
There was a long silence, broken by the call of a cardinal seeking its mate. The Owens will take you in to visit your grandpa. You're good, you're good medicine for him, you know. But I'm hoping you'll keep an eye on Barnabas. When you come in back in September, school will have started and Puny's coming to live with you. I'll be back by the time you've made your first A in math. I like old Puny. Puny likes you. Has Jenny been around looking for me? No, not that I know of. She's a pretty girl. Yeah, he jabbed the stick into the moss on the bank. Something on your mind, Dooley? He hesitated. I've been praying. You have? Tell me about it. Is it all right to ask for dumb stuff? I sure hope so. I ask for a lot of dumb stuff. I mean, like, help me to do it right when Doc Owen asks me to do something in the barn or hand him something when a calf is coming. That's not dumb stuff. God wants us to ask him for help. And speaking of how to do something right, you know what God has to say to you, Dooley? Dooley looked startled. What's that? In the, in the 32nd Psalm, he says, I will instruct you, Dooley, and teach you in the way in which you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Did he put my name in just like that? He did, just like he put my name in, and the Owen's name, and Cynthia's name. The Bible speaks to everyone who trusts him. I can't sit here jabbering, Julie said, leap, leaping to his feet. I got to feed them old dogs. You want to come? I'm right behind you. The boy set off at a trot up the winding path that led to the barn and the kennels. Then he heard a booming bark and saw Barnabas race to Dooley, who threw his arms around the black dog and rolled to the ground with him, shouting his name and laughing. One thing he could say for his secretary, if he'd had any reservations about this trip, any dread of going, the ride down the mountain to holding with Emma Garrett had made him positively ecstatic about getting on the plane, and the sooner the better. She had queried him so relentlessly about what he had packed or forgotten to pack that he finally admitted that he didn't know any of the answers, that Puny Bradshaw had packed absolutely everything, with his blessing. She was mortified that he'd allow anyone else to do something so personal. How could he be sure what he'd end up with over there across the ocean, and no running home to get it? When he saw that the first leg of his journey would be on a small aircraft that looked like a bathtub, and was patently made of tin, he did not flinch. Never mind that he had heard horror stories about small planes crashing into people's bedrooms, or that they could be as airless as bread boxes. He took his luggage out of the trunk of Emma's lilac Oldsmobile, and staggering under the weight of the suitcase and the suit bag, gave her a kiss on a cheek wet with tears, and vanished into the terminal building. He sat looking out at the runway, which was baking in a fierce summer sun. He was the one who was leaving. Why did he feel rejected somehow? Why had they all let him go? Now here he was, forced to do this thing, to travel thousands of miles away, across an entire ocean and have an adventure, whether he wanted one or not. The little plane took off with a rattle that had grown so ferocious, he felt the whole thing would come apart under him. If this was the so-called much touted technological age, how had they failed so miserably to make a plane that didn't do its job any better than this? He held on to the leather briefcase in his lap, the one the vestry had given him years ago for Christmas. What had he forgotten after all? He was mildly alarmed that everything seemed to be taken care of, that there were no loose ends. Then why on earth should that be alarming? For the simple reason that it happened so seldom in one's life that it encouraged suspicion. That's why. He opened his briefcase and pulled out a folder with a legal pad and a pen, and began to make notes about a sermon topic that had occurred to him only yesterday. There. That felt better. Next, he'd make a list of things to write home about, like how had the Rose Festival done. He'd forgotten to ask. And would somebody make sure the new bathtub at the Porter Place had a rail to hold onto? And when Cynthia heard from her agent about Uncle Billy's ink drawings, would she let him know at once? And had he put the premium increase notice on the Mortlake tapestry in his desk drawer or given it to Ron for the next festival meeting? He was surprised at the list he could make if he'd just put his mind to it. He happened to look out the window. They were flying over lush, rolling countryside with his own blue mountains to the right. He thought it might be the most beautiful thing he had seen in a very long time. There was a peaceful farm with acres of green crops laid out in neat parcels and a tractor moving along the road. There was a lake that mirrored the clouds and the blue sky and the shadow of the little plain as it passed overhead. Away toward the mountains, there was a ribbon of water flung out on the land, glittering in the sunlight, and beyond the river, a small white church with a steeple catching the brilliance of the sun. 
He closed the folder in his lap. Go in new life. Go in new life came unbidden to his mind. Not go in new life. He felt as if he were emerging from a long, narrow hallway, from a cocoon, perhaps. He felt a weight lifting off his shoulders as the little plane lifted its gleaming wings over the fields. Go in new life with Christ, he said silently, wondering at the strangely familiar thought. Go and be as the butterfly. And that is the end of At Home in Midford. If you like the books, there's quite a long series of them. There's, I think, eight, nine... Quite a few. Um, they're by Jan Karen, so feel free to look them up, read them yourself. I have to figure out what my next read aloud is going to be. If you have suggestions, I will read them and possibly act on them or just act on my own and just pick a book at, at blissful abandon. In any case, thanks for tuning in. Stay safe, stay healthy. We'll see you later.